Uh, it was also shared that those resources down on that table, the rescue those, those are free. Uh, they want you to be blessed with those. And I don't know, do you have anything you want to say about those? Sure. Yeah. So this, this booklet is just simply the question, how can we rescue those being taken away to death? That's a command. That's what we should do for our neighbors. But how do we actually do that? That's why we wrote this little booklet. To help you think through biblically what can we actually do to rescue our neighbors <coughs> from abortion. So, And then this one is examining what's called in vitro fertilization or IVF and encouraging you to look at what is actually happening in IVF and to think biblically and act biblically about it. Most people don't have any idea what is actually going on in, in vitro fertilization. And many Christians just march forward and do it when they can't for a season conceive by natural means. But we as Christians need to actually understand what is going on and then think biblically about it. So that's why this booklet exists as well. So we've got both of those over here or over there and please take them. And then we've got this little trifold that is trying to help you think through, value them both, think biblically about it, and and this is written by Aim Kansas. Kansas. And so I'm going to segue into Josh. Can you tell us about Aim Kansas? Sure. Aim Kansas is abortion is murder, uh, Kansas. Uh, it's an organization that uh, that we've just been put together to. Uh, work on the abolition of abortion in Kansas. Uh, we've already had a rally this last year at Sapeka at the Capitol uh, conference and then a rally um, and went in and uh, petitioned our legislators to make abolition laws. So um, if, you, if you're the kind of person who has supported Kansas for life in the past, uh, it would be best to not give them any more money. <laughs> and if you need money to go somewhere, in Kansas is a place you can give that money. Yeah. And Josh isn't on, you're not I'm even not. a part of AIM Kansas. I, so, I'm a member. Right. Of, yeah. But not a, local, but not like yeah. a leader or anything. You no. don't stand to profit in no. Profit. no. And no. when do you guys normally go up to Topeka for that rallying stuff? What time um, of year is that typical? That was in March. It was in March. Oh, this year. it was just so. It's, it's be when, a ways. It's when they're in session is when they would have like an abolition rally at okay. the Capitol. So when yeah. the legislature is in session. Okay. And then the rescue those. You guys normally have a winter or fall. Yeah, conference. rescue those. We're just an organization. Of, the board is me, two other elders of Baptist churches, and then a deacon. So it's just church leaders that have come together to educate and equip people to think and act biblically about this. And we have a conference every year, in, typically in December. This year it's the first weekend in November. We have a conference and we write booklets and preach sermons, do conferences, all that kind of stuff all around to just help educate people. And that's in Muskogee? We're based in Muskogee, but Rescue Those is just national. But it's but we live in Muskogee, and then the conference is in Muskogee. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Well, uh, as you can tell, um, we have a couple of new faces up here, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we're going to. What questions do you have for them uh, regarding to what Brett said? So um, they're here to aid him and help him and to help feed off one another. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. All right. Well, I'm Kelly Green, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm one of the three founders of the Free Will Baptist Abolitionist Society, even though I'm no longer Free Will Baptist now. So. Uh, but anyway, and I'm, I'm on a board with, uh, with Brett uh, for uh, a Liberty Rising Institute that goes in and tries to educate churches on how they can be active and have a healthy relationship with their legislators to try to get them. Um, abortion abolished so other than that I'm helping out with my buddy who's planted a church in Shawnee and uh, and I happen to be preaching down the road 30 minutes from here and I thought I'd step in and then they threw me on the platform. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Josh Eaton I pastor a Baptist church in Caney Kansas which is uh, our uh, east of here so 
uh, just came over to support all the work that's going on. I've been involved in abolition for over a year now and going down to the uh, murder mill in Tulsa every Monday for the last year. So, uh, just here to help. All right, well, thank you guys. All right, so what questions might you have for these guys? Don't say there's not. Yes, sir? So, how would you go about presenting this kind of a ministry to your elders when they're seemingly indifferent, not necessarily to the abolition of abortion, but the ministry aspect of it actually being as involved as like you presented we should be versus just giving to Choices Clinic and yeah. letting them do the work? Yeah. It's a good question. Thank you. And I've talked to them. They're open for me to present something to them. Yeah. That's tough. It's really tough to have some kind of ministry effort of a local church if the elders, the pastors, aren't leading. Because that's literally the job of pastors is to set an example for the flock, not only preaching, but to set the example, to say like Paul says to the churches, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says, that's why I send Timothy to you. Timothy's going to show you how to imitate Christ. And that's what pastors do. And when pastors won't lead out in things, most of the people in the church aren't going to do anything. So that's really difficult. But uh, the first step is just to try to educate them gently, educate them on the issue, present to them what the scripture says, and encourage them to really consider this. And I, I would give them the Rescue Those booklet. I'd give them one of those. <clears throat> and on the back of each of our booklets is a QR code that if you take your phone out and just point the camera at it, it'll pull up a link that you can go watch the feature length documentary that we produced. I mean, this is high quality, like you would watch in a movie theater quality documentary that we produced. And you try to show that, get your pastors to watch that. It's an hour and a half. It's entertaining, I mean, in the sense of it's well done and it's not just boring it's not just people sitting there teaching. It's it's actually a documentary. And that, maybe God would use that to help them see, like, we don't need to just be theoretically against abortion. We need to really actively love our neighbors. What would you guys say in addition to that? It's hard for me to answer that because I am a pastor. Yeah, so, <laughs> and so I learned about it. I'm like, I've got to lead the people that God has entrusted me to feed and shepherd. I've got to lead them and to be, to love our neighbors. Right. And a follow-up would be, even if you guys want to address it, let's say they say, uh -huh. you know, we're fine with what we're doing, then what can I do, and what should I do? Well, I've been an abolitionist for four years, and in the when I first got introduced to it, it took, you know, some guys, they became an abolitionist when they heard about it. And I was pastoring, and but it took me a whole year untangling my brain from all the pro-life stuff and matching it all up. And so I would say, you know, have some patience with, with them. I mean, ministers got a lot on their plate, but they're also responsible. Uh, but there is a guy here, I think, who's not on the platform, Bo Hill. Bo, do, would you have any words for him? Because you are specifically in that situation. I was in a church where I was, you know, when I woke up to the abolition movement, and it was 2018, and I went to my elders, and I went to my pastors, and back in Omaha, back then, uh, abolition, they were, you know, we were, they were trying to, like, say we were all nuts and crazy, and the typical stuff that they do, pressing down on us, but I was actually asked, you know, they said, well, we support what you do because of doing abortion on Madden Street with my daughter, my daughter. And I was asked not to speak about it in my church. And that right there uh, pretty much told me that they, are, they are not willing to listen to me. And I left and I found another church. Okay. And when I went into this church, I went in and I spoke to the pastor the very first day. And I said, I'm an abolitionist. 
know what the abolition is to live and it's not wrong. And so what I do in terms of, I said I go to the abortion clinics and I try to rescue patients uh, with, and their mothers by providing them real help at the abortion clinics. And my pastor embraced what I said. And um, anyway, I was left and uh, I did abortion bill in our church in Ben Nolan. I was not, I spoke about it to the members in our church, and the members in the church was listening to me, and I would provide them information, and I would answer their questions. And over time, my pastors realized that what I'm saying is not rubbish, you know, and it really it's opened their eyes to what's happening in the SBC and the pro life movement. It's opened their eyes to it because. I, for one, was the most pro-life person there was. My own daughter has had an abortion, and she's in the documentary, and she tells her story. Okay? There is nobody that was more pro-life than me. But the laws that we have in Oklahoma allowed my daughter to walk through every little window that they have, and, and, and my grandchild is signed in the abortion bill clinic that I go to. I'm saying this, we've got to be faithful. The results belong to God. And you know, let, let, let God do what God does. And let's not try to do that. Right. And just uh, be faithful. And keep trying. And if you, uh, I didn't want to leave. I was in the church, I was in 15 years. And I love the pastor. I've been on mission trips with him. But this was, it was, this was a, a hard truth. That they just could not have done. So, what I say is, you know, what, what the, the scripture guides what you do and, and how you approach your leadership. But, but keep a front swing. Don't give up. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bill. Is your church anywhere around here? It's in Wichita. Well, I would say that the documentary is the kind of thing that a, a, would really hit a preacher. And if at all possible, uh, if he, you, you could get him to actually meet the guys in the documentary, mm -hmm. and maybe he would want to take one visit to the abortion mill with them. Yeah. Sometimes we drive, up, drive yeah. up to Wichita and go with them to the clinic. The clinic is a place that wakes people up because you see women are literally walking in there when you're pleading with them. Please have mercy on your child. If you need help, come talk to us. And 99 times out of 100, the response is a middle finger and cuss words at you. And you're saying, ma'am, will you please come and talk with us? They murder babies inside this building. Please don't go in there. Let us help you. We have hope for you. There's hope in Christ. And the response is that. It's, it's kind of a wake-up call to what's actually happening among us. Yeah, so many people in the pro-life movement think that women are victims and even many pastors in, have that mindset that women going there are are victims themselves but that's why we say going there matters because it's where you see well when they yell back at you and say yeah i know it's murder i i can do this if i want to it's you know it's my body it, i can do whatever i want i you know they know what they're doing it, they're not a victim. They are the ones doing the victimizing. Yeah. And uh, and you see that most clearly standing there. Yeah. And getting them to go would be huge. If, you've ne if you have never been to an abortion clinic, just to witness, you need to go. Every single one of you yes. need to go. It will be a wake-up call to you. You know, the towns around the death camps in Germany that allowed those to happen. You know what the US Army had them do? The people that allowed those things to happen, after the Nazis were defeated and they abandoned those camps, they made the people in the town surrounding there go and walk through the camps. They made them go bury the dead bodies. Why? Because they knew people were being killed near them and they did nothing. I encourage you to go and just stand outside even if it's just bearing witness, pray, try to talk with people, and it will change your life. It will change your perspective on it.
and we all need that because it's most of the time it's out of sight, out of mind. The very first time one of my good friends went with me to the abortion clinic in Tulsa, as pro-life as you can get, he, he and his wife have adopted three children from birth that were like crisis pregnancies. And he was new to hearing about abolition and new to going to the abortion clinic. And he goes with me and I just try to get him. He's 10 years older than me. It's like, just come and watch. You don't have to do it. And if you think what I'm doing is wrong, please tell me. So we go, and I try to talk to one of the first young girls that gets there. She's probably 25. And my typical thing that I do is say, ma'am, do you know what they do here? And she turned to me and said, they murder babies, bleep, bleep. This ain't my first time. And walked in to have an abortion. That was the first thing that my friend ever heard out of someone's mouth at an abortion clinic. And just his life has never been the same. He goes all the time now. And he's lobbied his house representative and his house rep signed on to the abolition bill and supported it in Oklahoma the next year. Because that guy was like, oh my goodness. It makes it real when you actually go and see what's happening. And that women, most of the cars that pull up there are not cheap cars. No. It's not because of poverty. It's not because someone's coercing them. It's not because they think it's a clump of cells. Those are all the exceptions to the rule. They know what they're doing and they're doing it because our lawmakers allow them to. First time I went, uh, I had a panic attack staring on there because it, it starts to hit you for the first time in your life. You, you know the facts about abortion. You know there's a clinic and people are going in. But when you stand there and for the first time in your life, you know that you're seeing people going in. And then they're coming back out of murder. And you know that babies are dying just a few feet from you. It's, it, yeah, I, I just started like kind of panic and stuff. And so, and other guys have been like that, but it changes you for the rest of your life. Uh, you get your head straight. In Nazi Germany, the churches, when the trains would go by the church buildings, the trains full of Jews being shipped off to the death camps, the churches would sing. If they heard a train start, they would all stop what they were doing and start to sing and sing really loudly to drown out the cries of the people passing by in the trains because they knew what was happening and they just didn't want to do anything to stop it. That's what sadly many Christians are doing today. We're worshiping the Lord and we're singing loudly while our neighbors are being carried off and no one's speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves. And that's literally true because I know if I don't know that the uh, abortion mill in Wichita is open every Sunday, but there are some Sundays it has been open on Sunday. Cash. Yeah. I did not hear that. I'm sorry. When can this church family, Brother Kyle, come to one of those meals they're speaking of with yeah. you? With me? Uh, I'm down to go whenever. I mean, um, I know I get busy, but yeah, I'd be fine to go to Wichita. I don't, do you know, I know you go to Tulsa. Are there any churches that are actively, not on a know consistent of? basis that okay. I know At of. Wichita? Yeah. Uh, well, At Wichita. could you give me maybe some names? Down the road of some yes. that have yes, yeah. so okay. yes. I know. I'll, I'll come up here and go with you if you. Okay, want well there you go. go. Yeah. We got okay, Brett. We'll the if your first time is yeah. let, let some veterans go with you because yeah. you need to absorb a little bit. Yeah. Here's what we do. What we started doing about a year and a half ago, or a little more than that. Myself and one of my fellow pastors started going weekly. We did because we have the time. I'm a full time pastor. I don't have to tent make. I don't have to work on the side. I said, all right, we're going, I'm going once a week. And then my other pastor, he is not full-time, but he owns his business, so he changes his schedule, and he goes one day a week, too, on a different day. And then what we started doing for the most of the people that are part of our church is one Saturday a month, we do what we call worship at the murder mill. And we go and have a worship service right outside that place. Someone preaches like a 10-minute sermon 
We sing some songs. We pray and ask God to rescue babies and save sinners. And then however long people can stay, we try to minister to people that are pulling into that place. We try to talk to them and pray with them. And that's been huge. We do that. We committed to doing that once per month. And it's on a Saturday morning, so most people are a little bit more flexible. But that's been a huge blessing for us to get to do that. And it, it keeps it on the forefront of our minds. When you're going there once a month at least, it makes it real and it's sobering again that we can't be apathetic when our neighbors need us. William Wilberforce was told, you know, he's the man who led the abolition of the slave trade in England. And people were telling him that he was working too hard. And he responded with, let it not be said that I was silent when they needed me. Amen. And so he said, it, we've got to just figure out whatever we can do to love our neighbors. Same principles that they did there is what we need to do here. Let them not say that you were silent when they needed you. Sadly, if you guys were to go once a year, that would be more than most people ever have. Mm -hmm. It's not as I'm scary not saying as you go once a year. I'm saying, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I live an hour from Tulsa, and I went every Monday. So you're an hour from Wichita. Yeah. You can do it. So when we first started going, my goal was to get a church to adopt every day of the week. The church would say, we will make sure every Monday there are believers there. Preaching, pleading, and providing help. That was my goal. And so I just started telling everyone in the area, we need a church to adopt Monday. Our church did Tuesday and Wednesday. There were some other people going on Saturdays already, so we're just trying to fill them. We still to this day have not got one church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the, where the abortion clinics are that will cover any day. The first one who said, okay, I got, I said, we need Monday covered at one of these worship at the murder mill things that we were doing. Josh is there, who lives about an hour, hour 15 minutes from Tulsa, said, I'll be there every Monday. We'll step up and do it. The first one that stepped up, we live 45 minutes <coughs> from there. They live over an hour. The third church that stood up lives an hour and 15 minutes in the other direction. So there are... <coughs> There are plenty of opportunities to love our neighbors and sadly few pastors and believers who will stand up and say, I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, but we've got it. We've got to do our duty and love our neighbors. So I encourage you guys to think about that. And you're not going to get on your deathbed and wish that you had done less during an abortion holocaust. All right, I got a question. I'll leave. Okay, so I, I do want to talk about the value of them both. Uh, yeah. I know we have this in our hands, yeah. but we do have these guys up here. So, uh, you know, we started seeing the signs popping up around our community, around our state. I know some of you guys are from Oklahoma, and us Kansans won't hold that against you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, it was interesting. There was a big sign out here about a quarter mile or half a mile down the uh, kind of a highway, and at men's study on a Tuesday night, they said, hey, what's that all about? I said, well, I have no idea. And uh, so I, but that's, I call Josh, and he's probably thinking, who's this crazy guy from Ark City? Um, but we had a great conversation. It was probably almost an hour. And, uh, you know, I was asking him about this bill. And he said many great things, but I, I want to bring up a couple uh, that I think are very important. So this is being promoted as a pro-life bill, and we have been instructed as believers through, as long as I've been alive at least, to always vote for every pro-life bill. That, that, that's kind of like your your solid obligation. Like, right. you don't have to go do these things. Just vote pro-life. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk about that, but then you also made the comment that if this gets passed, we're going to move a step further away from abolishing abortion in our state. It will be nearly, it will, it will settle abortion into our state and the legal right to it for, it for a long, long, long time. To change the Constitution is a huge task. And if this gets written into our Constitution, it will be detrimental to abolishing abortion. 
uh, because it will give the right to to regulate abortion. If you're going to keep regulating it, it means you're going to keep it legal. And a Supreme Court, a state Supreme Court, that looked at our current state constitution and said, oh yeah, there's a, a right for women to have an abortion, have abortions in here. If they're going to be that liberal, then if we put into our state constitution that we can now regulate abortion, that, that kind of Supreme Court is only going to take that to its fullest extent, and when we try to abolish abortion, then it goes to the state Supreme Court, they're gonna say, nope, you only have a right to regulate it. You have codified abortion into your constitution with this vote. Now, I understand that our legislator, when it went through the Senate and the House, it was all Republicans voted for it and all Democrats voted against it. But it, the more that I think about this, it is the most, unbiblical and just completely unwise response to an evil. It is a horrible thing what the Supreme Court did in 2019, our state Supreme Court, and, and to find that right for abortion. But the answer to sin is not more sin. And we, when, we, when we go and tell women who've been raped, uh, the answer is not murder the child. The answer to one sin is not another sin. Well, this is what's happening here. You have sin, but now you're going to create an unjust law and codify it into our Constitution. That is also sin. And the answer to sin is never more sin. We, we must abolish abortion, and this will be a hindrance to it. It would be, uh, let me just put it in this kind of perspective. Let's say on a, on a federal level, we had Roe versus Wade in 1973, and with the leak, presumably, it seems like they're about to change their decision to say it's now back in the state's hands. Now, if they do that, that means that, that we're going to, in Kansas, codify abortion. So even if Roe versus Wade is overturned, it will change nothing in Kansas. It will change nothing. And it will make abortion legal for a long time until some point where we could overturn this. An amendment. Yeah. Overturning so, uh, an amendment in your constitution yeah. is nearly impossible. So think about it this way. Now that the federal uh, court is a... Uh, Supreme Court is about to go back on their decision. What if in the meantime we would have made a new federal amendment to our U.S. Supreme, uh, our U.S. Constitution, which said, oh, we all have a right to regulate abortion. And now they're going to come back and not, they wouldn't be doing this. Right now they're coming back to say, hey, we were wrong about what we saw, but if we would have changed our constitution, then they would have been able, they wouldn't be coming back and say we were wrong. They would say, oh, but now the constitution says yeah. there is. They wouldn't be overturning it, and that's the same thing in Kansas. At some point in the future, once we uh, do not retain the Supreme Court justices who voted for this wicked, uh, this wicked decision. Um, then at some point in the future, Kansas could do the same thing that the federal court is going seems to be going to do. But not if we write into it that we have a right to regulate it. Then we'll give, be giving them an excuse to say, yeah, you can only you break, you regulate it. Can I say something to your initial? So I think all of us probably grew up, like you were saying, vote for pro-life politicians. That's one thing we can all definitely do. The thing that you and I all have to realize is abortion is still legal because of pro-life politicians. That's why abortion is legal. Because they have just been trying to regulate it for 50 years. 60 plus million children are dead because of pro-life legislators. Abortion is not abolished in Oklahoma. We've been we've had an abolition bill since 2016, every year. It's not abolished because of professed Christian pro-life 
Republican politicians. They are the ones who kill it, who kill the abolition bill and just want to regulate abortion. We've been regulating abortion since Roe in 1973. And that is what has led to 60 million babies dying. So voting for pro-life politicians is why we're in this mess in the first place. Because they don't actually want to provide equal protection. They just want to try to restrict it. Even in the value them both, one of the leaders of it literally said, quote, this is for reasonable restrictions on abortion. Value them both has nothing to do with abolishing abortion, she said from the stage. And she's trying to, you know, appeal to the left and say, we're not going to get rid of abortion. No, 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 no. Value them both is just about reasonable restrictions. That is not a godly thing. We need to vote for people who are actually going to establish justice. And just because it says pro-life does not mean it's in line with God's word. In other words, if y'all want to never be able to abolish abortion, you let that bill get passed. Because, yeah, maybe you might be able to change the Constitution later. You understand how hard that's going to be? If the goal is to abolish abortion, that's going to be one of the biggest things that is going to stop it. If you're not getting everything that's being said, that's what it means. It's going to make it impossible. Relatively. Just to answer, I've been to some value them both meetings in where where it was supported. So just what's going to happen is they're going to tell you that if we don't pass this bill, then Kansas will become their uh, the abortion capital of the, <laughs> of yeah, the Midwest. The Midwest. Yes, yeah. because we will have the most relaxed laws, and in fact. The 2019 um, decision puts in jeopardy every single pro-life, any regulating of abortion in Kansas. And so that is what they're trying to answer by saying we can still regulate. They're trying to answer that so we can keep pro-life laws. They don't really, they don't want to abolish abortion. They just want to keep the laws we already have. Um, and... And they're, they're saying, if we do it your way, meaning to abolish abortion completely, then it won't pass and it won't get done. In fact, I talked to my house uh, representative back at our, uh, before the Roe versus Wade leak, and he told me again and again, this abortion will not be overturned until Jesus comes back. <laughs> and, and, well, if that's your view, then uh, you're not trusting God, for one thing. God can do more than you think he can. And we're not called to determine if it's going to be done in our lifetime or not. We're called to do what Jesus said to do. We're called to obey the Bible and to do, uh, to, to do what the Bible says. So That's exactly what they said during the abolition of slavery. Like, you're never going to abolish slavery. Look where we are now. But, but if they do this, it will keep abortion legal, and there will be tens of thousands of abortions on a regular basis if it passes. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're saying if we do it our way, then we will end abortion completely, yeah. and, and that would be o being obedient to God's word. Mm -hmm. They, they said, you know, the, the 12 spies came back and uh, 10 of them said, well, there are giants in the land and we can't do it either. There are always going to be those people who say you can't do what God said to do. Mm -hmm. But we're called to do what God said to do. Yep. And that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Another question? The lady in the back that left had a question. I, I do have a question then. Is it a fair assessment? then if you're voting on bills that regulate abortion, you are casting a vote that 
it's not okay to abort some babies, but it's okay to abort others. That's literally what the laws say. I, I don't think we think of it like that. The pro-life, pro-life regulation laws literally have to detail which abortions they're saying you can't do and which abortions they're saying you can do. That's what every pro-life law says. It literally gives, it lit- that's not the goal. It's not their intention of those who write it. They're not saying, I want these babies to die. That's not what those who are writing the bills say. But when you do anything less than applying the homicide code to everybody, what you're saying is it's okay to kill these babies. So that's what the bills, they actually, the bills in Oklahoma literally say it was, there was a dismemberment ban that said you couldn't use forceps and rip the baby into pieces. And then it said, this bill in no way infringes upon suction abortions or pill abortions. It's just a bill that says you can't do it with forceps. Other bills, the heartbeat type bill, says this bill protects those after a detectable heartbeat at six weeks. It does not apply to those before a detectable heartbeat. So the bills that the goal is saving babies literally say you can murder babies. And the reasoning is, I know that's not great, but we have to allow that evil so that good will come. And what does God say about doing evil that good may come? Paul was accused of doing that in Romans 3, 8. He says, shall we do evil that good may come, as some slanderously accuse me of doing? And he doesn't even answer the question. He doesn't say, no, no. He just says, those who say such things, their condemnation is just. And he's saying, what a wicked thing to say, that we should do evil so that good may come out of it. And that's what pro-life laws are in the end, because they say which babies can and cannot be murdered. And when you say which babies can and cannot be murdered, then you are treating a baby as less than human. That's right. And, and that's exactly what the 2019 Supreme Court case did in this state. It didn't even argue that a baby was an actual human being. Everything about the ruling, uh, and I've read most of it now, said, just argued, did a woman have a right over her own body? And, and they ruled, yes, absolutely. It was interfering with a woman's right to... Uh, Pursue happiness, liberty, and and all of that. And that's all the state, our attorney general, in in the case, didn't even argue a person as a person, only argued for the right to regulate abortion. And so what do you expect our state Supreme Court to do when the people arguing to try to end abortion aren't are making laws that treat babies as less than human, then you present it to the court and the court says, well, you don't even think a baby's a baby because you wouldn't have been for these laws if you thought this was actually a child. So you don't think it's a baby, so why should we? That's what pro-life laws do. A while back, with the Oklahoma uh, bills passed, a lot of people in a lot of churches celebrated. But with what we heard earlier, you would say that's not a cause for celebration. Absolutely. Would, would you kind of elaborate a little more on that? And on the one that we currently have? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the law that was passed in Oklahoma, people celebrate it because it says the way the pro life politicians are spinning it is that it's an abortion ban. From the moment of conception, it bans abortion. What they don't tell you is that it does nothing about self-managed abortions, which you can do 13 weeks and earlier gestation, which is with RE486, the pill that you can get. The FDA approved it in December that you can send it through the mail. So women now just can murder their babies in the privacy of their own home, and then law that was passed in Oklahoma does nothing to protect those babies. It just says an abortionist can't kill a baby. It also does nothing to the mother who hires a hitman to kill her baby. So it doesn't actually protect the child. 
And it also has the exceptions of the life of the mother, which is a farce. It has exceptions for rape and incest. And so it's literally, the law says an abortionist can't kill a baby. But a mom can. But an abortionist can as well as long as you jump through these hoops. That's not a cause to celebrate. That's an iniquitous decree that the law didn't actually protect babies but allows them to be murdered. And they're celebrating it as if they've totally banned abortion. It may shock you, but you need to have these kind of things straight in your mind. 13 weeks and earlier is when you can take RU486, the pill that starves a baby to death. 93% of abortions that happen in our nation are before 13 weeks. 93%. Which means 93% of the abortions that are already happening can just go on happening if every state in the union passed the bill that we have in Oklahoma. And that other 7% that they kill their children after 13 weeks gestation, what are they going to do once they realize the only way they can kill their baby is before 13 weeks? Well, they're not going to do it at 17 weeks then. They're just going to make sure that they do it before. That's why these kind of regulation laws, they don't work because it just tells people in the end when, where, how, and why they are allowed to murder their babies with impunity. So in Leviticus 20, the Lord tells his people who were tempted to offer up their children to a false god, Molech. He says, if you shut your eyes to the child sacrifice that's happening in your land, I will set my face against you. And we see that same type thing today. People are offering up their children in abortion, which is just sacrificing their children. And many of the church are closing their eyes to it. And some people's answer is, like if you think of Israel, they had altars in these high places to Molech, this false god. If we had pro-life people in Leviticus 20, in the Old Covenant, the pro-lifers would have said, we need to take the altar of Molech, where they kill babies, and we just need to move it really far away and make it really difficult for people to offer up their children to Molech. That's all a pro-life law is. It says... You can't do it this way, you can do it this way. And so it's the same effect as we just need to move Molech's altar and make it more difficult to find. But what are people going to do? They're going to wake up earlier if they need to. They're going to climb over mountains, whatever they've got to do, because you've said, well, you can murder your baby to Molech. We just made it more difficult. They're going to do that if you allow them to. And the Lord hasn't said, make it difficult for people to offer up their children on the high places. Frequently in the Old Testament, the Lord tells his people, tear those places down. You cannot allow children to be sacrificed. <coughs> and that's what we need to do. Metaphorically speaking, is abortion needs to be torn down, not just regulated. And you won't be able to do that if you vote for value the vote. You'll just be able to treat abortion like it's health care. I had to make up in my mind as I became an abolitionist, I need to tell my government and my representatives what it is I want. Not some pra pragmatic thing that I come with them or go along with them and pat them on the back. At what point are you, what kind of Christian are you going to be? Are you going to be the kind of Christian who finally decides what it is that is right, what it is that you want, and then you go demand it of people whose job is to represent you? Why would you go along with their garbage? Now, you have to admit that if every single pro-life person, every single pastor who was pro-life in the United States, if everybody right now adopted abolitionism, you know we would have those politicians by their throats and they would do what we want. And that would save those babies. So why are we going to expect less of ourselves as people in churches and as Christians, you've got to accept this fact. It's not murder light. They're killing for a half a century over 60 million people. That system isn't just going to let you sneak around it and outsmart it. 
until you fight with all your might. What do you think Oklahoma's got the most strict pro-life laws? Mm -hmm. Because they got guys like us breathing down their throats. We don't go down there and pat them on the back. They start panicking when we walk through the door down there. Because Oklahoma, guess where all those abolitionists are? Guess what state they're in? Well, isn't it odd that we start having even our pro-life laws are ratcheting it up, getting more strict, more strict, because they're trying to please us. They're trying to get us to shut up, but we won't shut up. And that's the way you've got to be. You've got to decide, is the scripture what you're going to demand? Now, you're a hundred years from now, you need to be able to know that you stood in a wicked day and having done all to stand. And this could be even stronger in Kansas. Mm -hmm. But as far as we're concerned, we're going to do this in Oklahoma. And we hope that you do it with us. Mm -hmm. uh, get that off my chest. Yeah. <laughs> we are. Thank you. <laughs> Why? I guess I have another one. Why does there seem to be such a large percentage of professing believers being passive or indifferent to the abolition movement. I mean, your thought, I mean, this is, of course, yeah, yeah I mean, this isn't, this is a reason, but because they're, thoughts. because they're hopeless and they don't think anything can be done. No. They've given up. No. We're, 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 we're <clears throat> on <laughs> Jesus's side and we think that his victory is only going to be accomplished after we all die. Or it's not going to be, we think that, that things will change only when Jesus returns, just like my representative told me. We don't think that God gave us a commission to obey and that it's actually going to do any good. That's why, why don't you share the gospel with people more often? Have you ever... Have you ever walked up to somebody and just looked at them and said, I'm not going to waste my time sharing the gospel with them. Maybe you didn't say it verbally, but you thought it, thought, oh, this isn't going to do any good. Well, that's what, that's what Christians are doing with legislation like this. They're going, up. Oh, it won't do any good for us to do that. And you know what's, why it's not doing any good? Because everybody thinks it's not going to do any good. <laughs> they, think, they don't want to obey what God said, and it's just an excuse for us to disobey, to, to be apathetic and not do what Jesus told us to do. Good. That's one reason. I think the main reason is because professed Christians love the idea that Jesus saves them from their sins, but they do not love to obey his commands. Because he says, do to other people what you would want done to you. It's just the golden rule. If we did that to neighbors in the womb, every one of you would be abolitionists and you'd be laboring in that. Because if you would treat them the way you would want to be treated, if you were in their situation, this game is over. But the reason people are apathetic is because they're selfish. Then they don't want to do the hard work of speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves, Proverbs 31, 89. They don't want to do the hard work of rescuing those being taken away to death, Proverbs 24, 11. People don't want to obey Jesus. They want to obey Jesus and they want to kind of put a leash on him, but not get too crazy with obeying what the king says to do. I think that's the main reason. People love the promises, but don't want to obey the golden rule. Any other? Jerry. There's a uh, epic called Radical that I, it's a minority of churches or denominations, but there are still a large number of churches that succumb to that effort. It says uh, they're really the kind of pacifists. So I can could, I could throw you out three or four denominations, but I, I don't want to do that. This is a problem in the church. They're going to obey Caesar. Mm. As long as Caesar doesn't ask them to disobey God. Yeah. Understand what I'm saying? Yep. They're going to obey Caesar uh, more so than most of us here would, would uh, want to obey 
obey Caesar. I mean, I'm going to obey, I want to try in my life to obey God. But, yeah. But we have denominations that take the radical patriot view, and they're going to obey Caesar. Yeah. Which comes to stuff. So there's a problem here uh, with some of the largest and tallest schools in our town yeah. who have taken a radical patriot view. Yeah. So it's a good point. I mean, you walk into the ministerial alliance in this town, if you're if you're a Bible believing pastor, it takes a lot of guts. Yeah. Because this is conservative Bible belt America. Yeah. So I don't know how you who agree with us theoretically, but they do not care enough to make time in their schedule to do anything. We have a lot of guys that agree, but just still don't do anything because they say they're too busy. You find a guy busier than the guys I know who go to the mill, and I'll give you 20 bucks. It's not about that. It's about we, we make time for what we want to make time for, and we cut out things in our life that we've got to cut out to be able to do what's important. You could be doing other things right now, but you're here because for some reason you wanted to come and hear about this issue. You could have been doing a lots, lots of things, but you chose to be here because you wanted to for some reason. And I'm glad you are, but that's how it looks in all of this. But you're right about, I would call it radical patriotism, is what you're saying. Statism would be the, would be another term for it, which is you just submit to the <coughs> civil government as if the civil government is God. 30 or 40 years ago, R.C. Sproul asked Francis Schaeffer what his biggest concern for the church in America was, and Schaeffer looked at him without hesitation and said, statism, because the American church submits to the civil government like the civil government's God. And Schaeffer saw that with Roe. So that you just do, the Supreme Court says you have to murder babies, and you're just saying, well, we got to allow that. Do you have a question? I was going to add to a comment. Um, as you were saying, um, we don't see preaching. Um, also, the other uh, view of you have to go either this way or this way. You can't vote for third party because those third parties are never going to win. Mm -hmm. And, you know, voting less or evil is still evil. Right. And so that's the whole mindset. You have to either vote this way or vote this way. Right. And so, you know, Right, because the alternative is pro-choice. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. And we should be examining whatever we vote for, setting it next to the Bible. Yeah. But voting less evil is still evil. That's right. Back to the statism thing. And, and when COVID started and our governor tried to enforce laws, many Christians were willing to to say, no, no, we don't have to obey that. Well, that just shows the selfishness which with we apply that, even that principle. When it interferes with me having to wear a mask or me not being able to gather with more than 10 or 15 people, then I'm going to defy the government or the governor. But I'm not going to try to even defy it for my neighbor's sake. Mm -hmm. And, and, and helping people see that, that's often a conversation I've said, well, you defied it. Like my county attorney said, we're not going to enforce what the, our governor said 
during some of that. And I'm like, yeah, well, I wish you would do that and apply it to abortion. Okay. We've done that in Oklahoma. We can smoke weed in Oklahoma. Can you guys do that here? No. Okay. Well, in Oklahoma, pretty much anyone can just walk in and it's medical. But you just walk in and, you know, you can say you have a headache or something and they'll give you a card. Everybody smokes weed in Oklahoma. Not everybody. Not me. No, <laughs> but <laughs> we've legalized smoking weed in Oklahoma, even though it's illegal federally. We have a pot store on like every city block. And it's illegal federally. We're defying the federal government to smoke weed in Oklahoma, but we won't stand up to the federal government, the Supreme Court, and say, you don't have the right to tell us that we have to murder babies. And we'll do it for that. We'll do it for pot. That further shows the hypocrisy of it. We've done it for lesser things, too, like for farmers, to free farmers up, to not have the regulations that the federal government has tried to put on them. We've nullified those decisions at our state level. I bet you have, too, in Kansas. I bet the federal government has told you to do certain things that your state government has said, no, we're not going to do that here. And that's what, if Roe is not overturned, it's irrelevant. If, o, if Roe is overturned, you're still in the exact same boat that you're in right now. If it's not overturned, you're still in the exact same boat. An abolition bill has a component in it that says the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade, they made it up. It's not in the Constitution. And so we're going to ignore that decision. And in case you forgot your civics classes, the Supreme Court doesn't make laws. All they do is render decisions and opinions on things. And they said that the Constitution of the United States says babies have to be murdered. Like, give me a break. Everybody knows that's not in there. That's why the Democrats right now in Washington are trying to get legislation passed to make Roe law because they know it's not actually law. So whether or not it's overturned or not, it doesn't change anything of what we do because we have the right as states to nullify a federal court's decision if they're trying to get us to break the Constitution couple of things toward this um, every in Kansas then we will vote to retain uh, Supreme Court justices when you go to the ballot box in November in November there's always a couple um, and so Caleb Stagel is the only Supreme Court justice who voted against the 2019 decision so it's probably um, worth retaining. Yes, he, he's the only one, only one worth retaining. So the rest of them, uh, some of them, I think two, have already been voted off in the previous, last year. Um, so, but then their replacement has been appointed by our current governor. So probably a good idea not to retain them too. But just so you know, Caleb Stagel voted against, uh, he was the one, and the six voted to keep abortion, uh, to find a right for women to uh, abort their babies in Kansas. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to note. Also, earlier we talked about um, going to the clinics in Wichita. So AIM, uh, Kansas, is going to host a training. Is it this fall? Is what I read. Uh, uh, the middle of July. They haven't nailed down a date yet, but we're going to hold a training because there have been other churches who said, well, we want to do this too, but we haven't ever done it before. So there's going to be a training in July for churches that want to get involved and haven't done it before. And so we'll keep you posted on that. It will be in Wichita. In Wichita. Yeah, that's great. The AIM Kansas guys were in Wichita yesterday at a church training people on the same kind of topic and helping people with this too. All right. Well, I think that we're going to conclude our night. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Brett, thank you for traveling. And everybody else, I know we had a lot of travelers. And I know some have already hit the road. Uh, so at this time, we want to push stop. And Grady, I think you're going to close us, close us out.